Hi, my name is uh, Daniel Moore, and uh, I am one of the teachers at the New Transmission Bible College here. And uh, I've been asked to speak on the subject of the metamorphosis of the rapture from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, let's just uh, pause for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this uh, great scripture. We thank you for your word. And we do pray uh, that as you look into this passage, that you will teach us uh, things here that will help encourage us and to focus our eyes on you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the uh, metamorphosis uh, of the, uh, the rapture is the subject. Uh, metamorphosis is a subject you may be quite familiar with. Uh, often we think about it in connection with butterflies. Uh, meta means to transfer, um, to change, and morphe is body. So metamorphosis is a change of body. Four mentions in the New Testament, two referring to the transfiguration of Christ and a couple of other references there. And even though it doesn't occur in the particular uh, passage we're looking at, there's another word for change. Uh, it nevertheless uh, indicates what is going to be happening at the rapture. So uh, I worked as a missionary uh, for a number of years in Papua New Guinea. And in Papua New Guinea is this particularly uh, ugly looking caterpillar. However, this caterpillar is the Queen Alexandra's birdwing butterfly caterpillar. And this is what it turns out to be. It's the world's biggest butterfly, the females up to 28 centimeters across, the males up to 20 centimeters across. And uh, here's one of the guys uh, just holding one for you to see. So the resurrection body is the same but different in the same way that the caterpillar um, and the butterfly are the same body, but so very different. The caterpillar is earthbound, it's limited, it's slow, and it's ugly. But the butterfly flies in the sky, it's unlimited, free, it's quick, and it's beautiful. And by contrast, uh, the current bodies that we um, live in will be as great a contrast, in fact, the greater contrast between that butterfly and the caterpillar that it comes from. So three questions. Uh, when will we receive a resurrection body? It's a fairly quick one. Most of the time, we're going to be looking at what will the resurrection body be like, and we may have a quick look at why is a resurrection body necessary. So firstly, uh, when will we receive a resurrection body? And as we just read, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52 tells us it will be at the moment in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Uh, here, the last trumpet is referring to, I believe, the last trumpet for the church, and that uh, trumpets uh, are used to call the church to gather. Uh, in the Old Testament, the church is uh, the the congregation rather was called together with trumpets, and then there was a trumpet to sound the moving off. And uh, I believe that's what this means by here, the last trumpet. So when we receive a resurrection body at the rapture, and of course, uh, the rapture is the time when the Lord Jesus comes to the clouds to receive his bride and the church to himself. Now, the word rapture, of course, doesn't occur in the Bible. It's based on a Latin word. Um, but it's from the Greek word harpazo, which means to snatch or seize violently. It means to be caught up to heaven, occurs 13 times in the New Testament. Um, and uh, this is a raptor, uh, which is about to do exactly what the harpazo word means, to seize or to snatch or to catch up. There are examples in the Bible, six of people being caught up without dying in two cases where the people have died and then were caught up to heaven. Second question, when will the resurrection, what will the resurrection body be like? And that's going to be answered in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 35 to 49. Now, I'm not going to do a lot of detailed exposition of this. I'm just going to try and pick out the aspects of the resurrection body. First thing to notice, though, is the Corinthians being brainwashed. That is, they grew up from only hearing one viewpoint. Uh, they weren't uh, allowed or been exposed to the word of God. They were taught the body was evil, the spirit is good, and also since the body decayed to dust, it would be physically impossible 
to resurrect it. Hence, people scoff at Paul in Acts 17. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 shows why believing the resurrection is essential to salvation and also gives the believer tremendous hope for what's to come as he describes what the resurrection body will be like. The outline of 1 Corinthians 15 is, of course, all about the resurrection. And uh, we're just going to pick up, uh, as I said, verses 35 to 49, looking at the body of the resurrection. So verse 35 begins, someone will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. And what we see here is that the first thing is the resurrection. It will be alive. Uh, it will be a living body. It will be so alive that by comparison, we will have seemed to have been dead before. Uh, this is the abundant life, the life with a capital L that Jesus described in John chapter 10, verse 10. It begins the moment that we're saved, but it's going to take on a completely new level of life uh, when we have a resurrection body. Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And in John 11, 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, it'd be like comparing uh, an experience of water, um, drinking in water from an egg cup versus trying to drink water standing under a waterfall like Niagara. The comparison between the two is, is, uh, is very difficult to comprehend. One is a uh, small amount of water, the other is uh, abundant. And so likewise with the living body that we will have. Secondly, it's a transformed body. Um, Paul writes, you do not sow the body that shall be. Um, it's like a seed planted in the ground. And the seed and the plant are from the same body, but they do not look anything like one another. And uh, some examples here from the time of Jesus, uh, the time that Paul's writing, these were common grains. So he may be referring to these wheat. You can see there barley and millet and uh, wheat uh, grows um, with a particular feature. But barley is slightly different, it has these feathered uh, tips to it, and millet uh, looks nothing like uh, those two. And likewise, other common foods of Paul's day, lentils and peas. Uh, lentils, again, produce bushes like this, and uh, pea plants are very different. So even though these are from the same uh, origin, the same body originally, they do look very different, just as the caterpillar and the butterfly also look very different. So the transformed body, um, one of the questions that Paul is answering is this question, well, what if somebody's body is decayed to dust? Uh, what if they're eaten by an animal? What if they drowned at sea? How then can you be raised from the dead? Just a couple of things for you to think about. A single strand of DNA can be captured at the sign of, scene of a crime. That would be enough to identify a criminal. Uh, as humans, we clone plants and animals from just a few cells that have DNA in them. The current PCR test for coronavirus only requires a minute amount of RNA to detect the presence of coronavirus. So if we as humans can do these things, this is not a problem to the creator of the universe. Uh, our DNA is known to God. Even if there were none of our DNA uh, in existence physically, that's not a problem. God knows all of our DNA, and he is perfectly capable to resurrect us um, uh, as, uh, as, as we are. Then we go on to verses 31 to 41. It says there, God gives uh, it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies, and there are terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. So a third thing we see here, it's a God-given body. God gives it a body as he pleases. The resurrection body is given by God. It pleases him, that what the body that will be given. It is like Christ. It is holy. It's pure. It will be perfect. Just as each seed produces a unique plant, so the resurrection body um, will be uh, different, but they will all bring glory to God. And they vary in glory. So too, the resurrection body will be far more glorious than the Adamic sin-cursed version. Paul goes on to say, one star differs from another star in glory. And this perhaps might have bearing on rewards, uh, but that's uh, for somebody else to take up that topic. And then 42 to 43, we see Paul continues his argument. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. 
It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. So the fourth thing we see, it's an incorruptible body. Um, it's a body that is never decaying, it's never wearing out. It's never getting old, it doesn't break, it doesn't fail. Remember that uh, God said to Adam, in the day that you eat of that tree, you will die. And the term there in the Hebrew is dying, you will die. So not only was Adam immediately separated from God, but his body began to die, it began to run down, it began to break down. Imagine being in an eternal, undying Adamic body. With age, you would get arthritis, deafness, blindness, lameness, senility. You'd have dementia. What a life. That is the only life that would be possible in an Adamic body. You'd have all the burdens of life and none of the benefits. So eternal life just by itself is nothing to look forward to without a new and a constantly renewed body, which is exactly what we will have. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, for we know that if it, our, our earthly house, that's tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Put, uh, Peter here picks up the illustration of a building versus a tent, something that is permanent versus something that is temporary. And uh, of course, our heavenly bodies will be as new after a thousand years as the first day, permanently new, permanently alive, permanently glorious. Uh, not like your brand new phone that after a few weeks, it's not so shiny anymore. Uh, maybe you break the screen. It's not so good. That won't be the case with our new uh, resurrection bodies. And then he continues. It's a glorious body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. The, news body, the new body is praiseworthy. It uh, perhaps will be shiny in the sense of emitting light. Uh, it will be holy. It will be glorious. It will be worthy of honor and respect. Uh, all reasons for dishonor will be gone from this body, and it will be suitable for giving glory to God. Philippians 3 verse 20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So our new bodies will be like Jesus. Um, that's what it says there, conform to his body. And yet, like yourself, we will be able to recognize each other. For example, um, Moses and Elijah appeared in the transfiguration, and they were recognizable to Peter, James, and John. And uh, as that was, they still did not have their uh, resurrection bodies. So it's certain that our body, we will be able to recognize one another um, in our resurrection bodies. Um, I think the greatest compliment in heaven will be, my, you haven't changed much. Um, of course, some of us might not even be recognizable, will have changed so much from our, our earthly uh, selves. And then we see it's a, a powerful body. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Um, this new body will never be tired or weak or ill or unable to think clearly. Uh, some of you studied for exams, and you know sometimes you're just uh, overwhelmed and, and you just find it hard to concentrate. Uh, that's the weakness of our bodies. But then we'll have a strong spirit, soul, and body. Remember, Jesus said to the disciples in Gethsemane, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. They, they wanted to stay with Jesus and pray, but their bodies uh, were just not able to do that. And the body is a vehicle to serve God in, uh, but the old one is limited. Um, imagine that you go um, to uh, a meeting in an old car, and uh, you've been asked to share in some way, maybe give a testimony or help in the singing or something. And uh, on the way, the car breaks down. This vehicle has let us down in serving God. And the same is true of the human body. We, we try and serve God in this old vehicle, but it sometimes lets us down. We get sick, we get ill. For various reasons, we are unable to serve as we would. But with a resurrection body, that will no longer be true. There'll be no limits. There'll be no breakdowns forever. This powerful body is uh, some clues to it can be looked at from the resurrection body of Jesus. Uh, firstly, some things that are uh, uh, true of our own bodies. Jesus' body was recognizable, although, of course, um, initially some of them did not perceive him. Later, we see Jesus' voice was recognized by Mary Magdalene. Jesus' body had real flesh and blood. The resurrection body is not a spirit. It has real flesh and blood. It could be touched and handled. We also see that Jesus' body could eat. He ate a piece of roasted fish and some honeycomb, which he ate in front of them. And he also was given the promise that he will, um, he will uh, eat 
uh, in the uh, uh, in the kingdom. Uh, we also see the promise, of course, of the marriage supper of the Lamb. So those are some of the things that apply to our bodies uh, now and to Jesus' body as well, even after it was raised from the dead. But some of the new things um, that are not quite so typical, um, interesting, they, our current culture is so excited about some things uh, they wish that we could do. And a couple of these, uh, number one, teleportation, um, or however you want to describe this, Jesus could appear in a locked room, he could go through walls or doors, and he could disappear at will. Uh, will we be able to teleport? Um, that would be handy if we want to explore the universe in real time. Um, of course, you know, when you make a new heavens and new earth, uh, if you have to get in a spaceship and travel for uh, long periods of time, that will not be a very suitable way. So possibly that might come into play. Uh, we see that Jesus could move rapidly from place to place um, without walking or being visible. For example, the Emmaus Road, um, he did walk on the Emmaus Road, but then he disappeared. And then he reappeared to the disciples uh, in the upper room uh, later that same day. And what about flying? Uh, most people would love to be able to fly. Um, but uh, when Jesus uh, went back up into heaven, his body uh, floated or flew up. You see that in Acts 1. Uh, will we be able to fly? Um, we can't be certain about uh, either of these two. But it's interesting, the New Jerusalem, um, if it remains suspended over the earth, certainly be handy getting from there to the earth and back again. And for sure, we will fly at the rapture. So a couple of things there that people have longed for down the ages, maybe both of those will be true of the resurrection body. It's also a spiritual body. Um, we see that there. And it, uh, it's, a body, it's a body that has a mind that can understand the deep things of God. Uh, we see that in 1 Corinthians 2. And uh, in verse 15, it says, he who is spiritual judges all things, but he himself is rightly judged by no one. In other words, the person who is spiritual is able to discern and figure out um, how to understand things as God would understand them. There are things that confuse us now, for example, the Trinity. Um, how can Jesus be completely God and completely man? And yet then that will all become easy and clear. We will always think in a spiritual way. We will think about the things of the spirit, about things of God, the things that please God. We will never think about simple things, never about fleshly things. A question that's often asked about the resurrection body is, will we be able to sin in our resurrection bodies? And the answer is no. The sin nature, the Adamic nature, will be gone forever. And uh, the three things that we uh, feel the weight of at the moment, the world, the flesh, and the devil, uh, those uh, three features that uh, we often prone to sin, uh, none of those will be active uh, upon us in a way that they are at the moment. Going on to verses 48 and 49, uh, it says there, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. As is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So the body will be a heavenly body. Uh, it will be a holy body, a high body, a pure body. It will be made in the reflection of the man from heaven, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven was his home. Heaven will be our home. It's a certain body. Uh, Paul writes there, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Uh, we will bear the image of the heavenly man, that is the Christ. He is the second Adam. He is the new uh, creation, the new order. And we will bear his image. We shall be like Christ. Uh, this continues in verse 51 and 52, where it says twice, we shall be changed. Not we might be changed, we possibly changed. We will be changed if we are good Christians. It's an unconditional promise of God. We shall be changed. We are the bride of Christ, and he will take us to be with him forever. And the proof that this is going to be the case is that we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee or the arabon, which is the engagement ring, even in modern Greek. A modern Greek engagement ring is called an arabon. And the Holy Spirit is the guarantee that one day we'll be married to Christ. You find the same word there used in Ephesians 1. Uh, 12 to 14. Um, the third question we considered was, why is a resurrection body necessary? It is an essential body, and the reason for that is given there in verse 50. It says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, your current physical body is not suitable for the kingdom of God. In other words, church aid believers are not able to go into, onto, inherit the kingdom and reign with Christ 
unless they have been transformed. It is essential. In order to serve and reign with Christ in the millennium, which is what we are promised in the New Testament, we will need to have transformed or resurrected bodies. The old body is not a suitable vehicle to serve God in. It's not fit for purpose. We need an incorruptible and immortal body. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I think an illustration of trying to use our current old bodies in the future would be like putting a bin lorry uh, in a Formula One race. And uh, if you can imagine it there on the starting grid, um, it's just totally inappropriate, totally does not fit. It's totally unsuitable. Uh, a bin lorry is not a suitable vehicle to be in a Formula One race. Likewise, our old bodies are completely unsuitable for the, um, uh, for the millennium and also for the new heavens and a new earth, which will come following that. Um, the resurrection body is an immortal body. Uh, this body must put on immortality. It must. Um, this, again, is essential if we are to inherit the kingdom. Uh, immortal means never dying. Uh, that's eternal life and life with a capital L. So we see the same thing we've seen before. This new life will be um, abundant. So... <clears throat> In summary, then, we have the resurrection body is uh, living, transformed, God-given, incorruptible, glorious, powerful, spiritual, heavenly, certain, essential, and immortal. What a great future we have to look forward to. And 1 John 3 verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There are two other mentions of metamorphosis in scripture, and I'd like to finish with these as they provide a good application to us of the truth of the metamorphosis of the rapture. The first one here is in Romans 12, verse 2. And Paul writes, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, metamorphosis, by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul's exhortation to us is not to become like the world, to become like unbelievers, uh, not to be like the Corinthians who listened to their upbringing, their teachers who told them that there was no way the resurrection could be true. We too are brought up to believe many things that are counter to what God says. And we have to sometimes resist the pressure of the world that tries to squeeze us and push us into its mold. And then Paul gives us how uh, we can do this. He says, don't give in. Instead, renew your mind, which means to listen to God's word, to believe what it says, and then to apply it uh, to your life, to trust God. God is true. God was there at the beginning. He will also be there at the end. And what his word says is true. And all that has been talked about um, so far will come to pass one day because God has promised to do it. The final reference to metamorphosis in scripture also teaches us something helpful. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it says, We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And uh, many people wonder, well, how, how do I grow as a Christian? How can I get to know God better? How can I be more like Christ? And very simply, it is exposure to the Word of God. Uh, every single Christian biography that you can find, you'll find this is the common denominator. Um, every Christian who has done uh, things for the Lord has been somebody who reads their Bible. And reading the Bible changes us as we do so. The Bible uh, is like a mirror. When we look into the word of God, we see Christ in there. We see him in the Old Testament and we see him in the New Testament. And as we read and we see the word of, we see Christ in the scriptures, the spirit of God takes the word of God and somehow uses it to transform us to become more like Jesus. And that's from glory to glory. So it's a process. It's not an instant thing. It's, uh, it's something that goes with us all our earthly lives being uh, made more and more like Christ. Uh, think about some of the old Christians that you know who are um, a joy to be around. They, they've walked with the Lord so many years uh, on the earth. And so uh, how does that apply to us today? Well, it, it's basically reading God's word each day. Um, it's great if it can be unrushed. Um, I've been reading through the Bible for many, many years now, and I found it's a most helpful way to be balanced in scriptures, to see things in their context, and also for 
uh, God to speak through his word. But whatever it is, uh, make sure that you are reading uh, God's word, not because you have to, but because this is the means by which we can be transformed and changed. And then take something from what you've learned and uh, talk to somebody else about it and try and apply uh, what you have found. So I hope that's helpful to you, the metamorphosis of the rapture. Um, it is coming one day and uh, we'll be blessed uh, as we follow Lord uh, in our lives.